My name is John Weir Warner Jepson, and I've been a dabbler in the arts most of my life in music and uh, color, pictures, painting, weaving, needlepoint, anything where there's color and sound, color and music, and the color in music, and the music in color. <laughs> I gotta say, my mother did a lot of stuff to make me happy. She gave me a lot of toys that had color in them. I remember a little workbench with colored pieces on it. I could hammer them into different ways. But I had a lot of things that, that had color in them. She got me records of music, Winnie the Pooh. The music was wonderful, very cheery. The piece I remember the most was in 6-8 time, which is the, the meter that I love still today. And that was also, my sister was getting big band music, a record I latched on to of Tommy Dorsey called Traffic Jam. Very noisy. I remember my mother not liking it because it was too noisy. She said, how could anybody like that? But I did. The first records I began to notice were the, those classical ones of my brother. He had Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto, which was scintillating. He had Scheherazade, which just I loved a lot because it was exotic and full of color. And it was oriental, it was not Western. And it was full of dances. And it was very dramatic. I didn't care for the Germans so much. But Tchaikovsky and the Russians I did. But then I discovered Ravel's Bolero, which really blew me away. I arrived on Labor Day in North Beach, 53, and within a week I got word from USC that I'd been accepted. As I started to pack, I then I started to think further about what it would be like. I didn't have much money at all. I'd put myself through Oberlin by waiting tables and working on the Oberlin Inn, and as a desk clerk and waiter, and, and plus I'd also got a lot of scholarships. So I didn't know what was going to happen in LA. Plus, Oberlin was it was not a happy experience because I loved making music before I went to Oberlin. But when I was in Oberlin, I had to do so many things to fit their rules. And I was always getting in trouble with the teachers, especially my first year. He said, well, uh, the assignment sounds nice, but you didn't do what I asked you to do. So I was, that was my first year. But my last year, I was still being called into the office and say, uh, the teacher says you're not doing the work that you're supposed to be doing or something. And, and I said, I just want to learn what I, what I want to learn, <laughs> which is a stupid thing to say to a, a school. But he, and he even said, well, if you don't, you're know, not happy or something. I don't know what he said, but it was a, it, I could sense a threat that you better, you're going to have to get out if you don't want to do it. But this is my last year. So I graduated finally. And by this time, I'd written a lot of pieces. My sister had taken uh, dance classes at the Halpern Lathrop Dance Studio on Union Street in San Francisco. She suggested I go there and see if I could improvise for the classes. So I did that, and I immediately was accepted at $3 an hour there, and also then I went to State College to see if I could get a job accompanying there, where Lou Harrison had also been working as an accompanist. So I was playing a company at City College, State College, and Warner Lathrop Studio. Merce Cunningham came into town, and since I was the accompanist, I was the accompanist for him. And it, he was totally quite different from well and tall and fierce, and he just went lickety split across the floor, kept those students hopping. Sometimes when I was accompanying, well, I was getting so bored. <laughs> After eight years of it, I'd sometimes take a book and 
to put on the piano and read while I was playing the piano. Not too cool. But sometimes uh, I'd get really good at, I'd mean, be in a really good mood and the music would come out really nice and he would stop his routine. The routine was always first on the floor, laying on the floor and doing stretches there, then sitting up and then standing up and then walking. It was always that way. But sometimes when I was, I guess say it was hot, he would disrupt and just start moving uh, the whole class in response to what, what was going on. It was fun when those things, when that happened. It wasn't regularly, of course. I followed her and helped her over to her dance classes on her deck. It was a beautiful house up in the hills with madrone trees coming right up through the deck. I would go over there and start making music for them, mostly with percussion instruments, just like I had done with Doris Dennison for Wellen. But at the same time, it was in the mid-50s when the tape recorder was invented and was made it available for consumers. And that changed a lot of things. Uh, I had one, and I'd go over to Ann Halpern's, and she had one. But at her house, I started to experiment by recording sounds in her basement and began to cut up the tapes and splice them together in different ways. But uh, it would make this sound that would have rhythms that you'd never have any other way. Yeah, while I was there in that little house in that apartment on Union Street and I was doing some um, company, I decided to look at, get a camera. And I studied up and finally decided to get a, not a 35 millimeter, but the two and a quarter square, which only had 12 pictures per, per roll. But you could see exactly what you're going to take. And, and it was good size, and I fell right in love with it. Anne was a good friend of James Broughton, who was the poet and the filmmaker in town. They were making sort of humorous films. They decided to put on a 
show at the Playhouse, the San Francisco Playhouse, which was at the corner of Beach and Hyde, across from the Buena Vista. Also in the in the review was some poems that James Broughton had written that she, he wanted them to turn into songs. I had never written a song in my life. I didn't like. I hated opera. Didn't want anything to do with it. But I, I uh, took his words and made a song, which somebody sang. I, I think there were two, but I don't remember the other one. But I remember this one song, and I worked on it. Didn't know what I was doing, and I just uh, put a lot of notes together. At the time, there was a woman by the name of Helen Adams who was a Scottish spinster in her 50s, very eccentric and bizarre. She lived with her sister. And she had written a ballad poem, a very long story about a bunch of characters, low life and high life in San Francisco, set in the time of the 1906 earthquake. She recited her poems with all the stage directions and all the characters all by herself in people's living rooms, wherever she could. And I heard it once, I was amused, but the Playhouse, which was owned by Kermit Sheets and was who was a good friend of James Broughton, who was the poet who had the pieces in the previous show that I'd done. The two of them decided to reform it, this piece by Helen Adams called San Francisco's Burning into a, a theater production. 30 miles, 30 miles to sail, every wave behind us bigger, than a whale, 30 miles to San Francisco Bay, round the Farallone Islands in the last light of day. Beauty walks the lightest streets and streets dark and blind. Stepping slowly by Last tall star of Saturday night Smoldering in the sky Turn away, turn away Gentlemen of the town Hanged man will have your blood If you follow that In 1964, Don Buchler, as well as Robert Moog, both invented the first audio synthesizers. Moog was on the East Coast in New York City, and Don Buchler was on the West Coast in Berkeley. The synthesizers were quite different in that one had a keyboard and made scales, or the most use of his, his synthesizer was to imitate other sounds, real instruments like a trumpet or flute or something. Whereas Don Buchler did had no keyboard except a sheet of, of metal with slits in it, about 12 slits, and knobs above these slits that you could tune each one of the slits. So when you touch the slit, you'd get a sound. And he had two knobs that were tied in with it, so you could tune that, that slit to a, a different sound. And so that's the well, that's how you played. But you know, you went since they were all analog. It, was, it, it wasn't any specific sound. You could make any sound you want, you know, from one end of the spectrum to the other. And uh, there was his. I fell in love with his that synthesizer and just had the best time making things with it because it, it was another way to make sounds that were not real and to make rhythms that were. Un uncapable by any human. So you could you could transport yourself to just new tape loops could do. So the, these, these two phenomena, just a decade apart or less than a decade apart, changed sound forever and gave us new ways to hear sound and new ways to imagine things from sound. The San Francisco Tape Music Center was created 
by Mort Zabotnik and Ramon Center. And the Buko synthesizer was brought into that place, and I would go over there and start making music there. When I discovered the Buko synthesizer, it was, it was just a very mind-blowing event because the colors, and especially the rhythms, I loved, always loved rhythm, was, was very easy to make. And the sounds that you could play on it was very easy to make. Mort Sebetnik was had just gotten hired from Mills to Cal Arts, which was just opening. He was going to be one of the first professors there, and he knew that the Tape Center wouldn't survive without it being uh, connected to a university, to which which would, could support it. So, the Tape Center, including the Buchla and the tape recorders, went to Mills, where it was housed and under the caretaking of Pauline Oliveras. One interesting thing about it there is that it was never locked. I went over there all the time to spend nights to record whatever I could find. But they did have time slots for people, two hours each. And I would always choose the, the last one, eight o'clock. And since it was never locked, I could stay there as long as I wanted, which I did because looking for those sounds on the bucle were so intriguing and fascinating and thrilling, I would sometimes stay all the hours of the night. I didn't know anything about the equipment or how anything worked, but I just turned the knobs and played the keys. Ended up with about 200 half-hour tapes of raw sounds for Buka, which I used in uh, scores for ACT, some films. I would begin to take the music that I've created because it was so fascinating and jolly, I guess I'd say. I would take to parties, and people were equally fascinated because it's such a new sound and new rhythms and new spaces, uh, and especially if you're tripped out, you might the spaces were even better. But not everybody was, really. I never, never worked or composed stone. I didn't want to because I didn't, I wanted to enjoy this, what I was coming up with in full. And I didn't think if I was stoned that I would be only half there. I'd be looking through a window or somehow. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be right in touch and feel it directly. So I never worked with stone. Uh, the friend who, who introduced me to grass thought I had already been using it, <laughs> but I wasn't. Did that for the next, oh, three or four years. You know, I guess it was a year with Pauline Oliveras and then two years where Tony Nazo and Lowell Cross were the caretakers. And in the second year, of, the third year of it, second year of to Tony, they locked the doors. <laughs> no sooner did they lock it than a, within a month or so, the place was robbed. <laughs> Which is, just tells you what about, tells you about human nature. So I would take some of these sounds to these parties and uh, Pretty soon, the San Francisco Art Institute asked me to bring one over and play it before the students at one noon. So I did that, and there was an artist there named Lee Hastings, who was a student, and she was having a show coming up in a gallery. And she asked me if I would play these sounds for her opening, so I did. And it was quite fascinating. People liked the sounds, because again, it was all new and fresh and stimulating. So more and more, artists would ask me to do that.
that was there to uh, make the opening. The Museum of Modern Art invited me to do a show called The Machine Show, where all the artists' pieces were made out of mechanical things. They were more of objects and sculpture, not so much paintings on the wall. But I guess they were both, but they were sort of hard-edged. Now, up until this time, the openings for the museum were always nothing but a string quartet, <laughs> something very quaint. They had a wonderful rotunda in the museum, a marble room with four uh, alcoves in it, every corner, big ones. And I decided to put huge A7 speakers, which is what we, we used at the rock concerts. They're about five feet tall in each corner and played this electronic music over these things. And so the music really carried throughout the whole museum. And it was a big ball, lots and lots of people. It was all new sound for everybody. Nobody heard it, this kind of music before. And one guy was amusing to find one guy in a business suit who probably had never experienced anything like this before. He was sitting right smack in front of one of those speakers, which is, which is so loud that the whole thing, you, your, your whole body vibrates if you sit in front of one. And that's exactly what he was doing. <laughs> Two years later, they had me do another one. This one called the Plastic Presence. Everything was made out of plastic. And they had me this time do some in the environment. They asked me to, to do some environments in the, the room. And I got pieces of fiberglass, squares, octagons, and triangles, and made a geodesic dome with nuts and bolts that was about six feet round, and put it on the stage. And it was very beautiful because you could, uh, it would glow, had milky white quality about it. And I, could, I had found two little speakers uh, I made a, uh, about six, six inches square. Good sound, though. And I hung them inside the geodesic dome so people could come up to the stage and put their head inside one. I left one hole out of the dome. So they could put their head inside and then put it in, the sound inside that dome was like getting out of a cathedral. It was, the, re, the echo and the resonance was tremendous. So you had these two experiences coming, pulling out of the dome, you'd have this huge speakers blaring out of this marble hall, but you put your head in the dome and it was a completely different world for them. In 1967, James Broughton decided to make a film called The Bed, uh, about a bed that was outdoors in the fields in Mill Valley. It was an art film, 20 minutes long, and he would invite a lot of his friends on weekends to do things that he would suggest on the bed. And uh, all kinds of people came. Alan Watts was one, Imogene Cunningham. Many people ended up up on the cutting room floor. James said he, he would only chose scenes that were distinctive or was very unusual. A couple years later, my brother, who taught at the University of Minnesota, was approached by one of his, the teachers there and said, do you have a brother named Warner Jepson? And he said it was. And he said, they're showing this film called The Bed in the classes to the student psychi psychiatry students because the film was to show them 
bizarre kinds of behavior so that the shrinks who are kind of straight-laced themselves would know how to deal with patients who would come in who might be pretty bizarre and they could be ready for not to be too shocked by what's going on out there because there was a lot of sort of shocking things in the film. There was another opening, big opening coming up called the Plastic Presence, where everything was made pretty much out of plastic. I was given introductions to some plastic places around town, and I decided to make a sandbox that would incorporate these little tiny plastic pellets that felt really good. You put your hand in them, and it just sort of slid right down into the depths of them. So I thought to make a plastic box that people could sit on and put their feet in this, this, all these uh, pellets. I got a, a five foot cubic box, cardboard box of these pellets they gave me. Put it on the back of a truck with a friend and I drove out of the parking lot, come to a, a red light and suddenly the whole box fell off the back of the truck. And of course, a lot of those pellets just spilled. They were just all there loose. So <laughs> there was nothing much to do, but I remember a policeman coming by just by chance, looking at it and just shaking his head while he scampered to put the box and all of its pellets back on the truck again. And uh, no, no consequences. We just succeeded in getting it back up again and going off to the museum. So while I was there at the National Center, making music for the different pieces. They were ended up with five pieces, programs that were broadcast over national PBS called Video Visionaries, a half an hour each. And I was on all of them. Uh, and then uh, the, we lost the funding. So when Nixon came in, I think it was related to the fact that Nixon came in, that was seemed to be the talk that the funding stopped. So there was just a few more uh, months before it finally, the National Center closed. So before it did, I went, went over there and started to experiment myself because nobody was there much. So I would hooked up the Buchla synthesizer and put it into the video mixer, which is the mixer was a specially made, uh, the, I put, the Buchla, I connected two cords from the Buchla into the video mixer, which had been, the video mixer had been made early on by a guy named Larry Templeton. It was unique, unique just made for the center to do, to take visual, uh, audio, uh, visual signals from the video signals into it and mix it with color and combine it with other uh, inputs. So I, Put in it. My inputs were coming from the audio synthesizer and ended up making unique uh, visuals because the colors were so different. And but one other thing was that the the, the signals from the audio were bringing in frequencies, and so it would make movement and make bands that would move up and down, up usually up the screen, in different width sizes in different widths and at different speeds and in different colors.
and I just had the best time going through that. And but eventually, I decided to aim a camera on, on something, and I chose my head because it had shape; it wasn't flat, and it also moved, though I hardly ever moved. But uh, it gave color to this face that was uh, unbelievable. So I ended up making a lot of tapes, and it turns out after we found all the ones that have recently been found, 30 tapes of this experimental video, which has just been uh, copied off into high quality discs and uh, comes to 50 gigabytes of material. Uh, Luminous Procurus was I don't, I forget the date on that, but I think it's about 1972, 71 or 2. Stephen Arnold had just graduated from the Art Institute, and he was famous for making scenes with a lot of costumes and makeup and fantasy and almost like Cocteau. And he wanted to make a film, and he found five backers. The story was, as far as I know, that he wanted to make a film and somebody said, why don't you make a pornographic film, then you make a lot of money and then you'll have enough money to make the film that you want to make. So that was the plan. And so the story revolved around two guys coming to a house that was owned by this strange woman who proceeded to take the two of them down a lot of underground passages where they would see room after room after room of odd, bizarre behavior. Thank <laughs> you. 
this program. Pancakes. Oh, everything's falling. Oh, you make oh. cured. Oh. It's one cup of milk, one egg, a little bit of salt. How much? A little salt, all because it needs salt. And uh, a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of baking powder. If you're going to use sour milk, then you have to use baking soda as well. And use sour milk when the milk's going in, and that's the time to make the pancakes. Anyway, so there you've got the dry ingredients. Add, melt a spoonful of uh, butter, or I use just a little sp a spoonful of oil. Not all of it, I don't think, but I, I never did. Or, uh, oil, and then uh, then you just add, you beat all that up. Then you add the flour. Now, if you make it a cup to a cup. It's going to be, they're going to be a little thicker. It'll be more traditional. But if you want to make them a little thinner, back off on the flour. And you can, as you mix it up, you can see if it's sort of fairly liquid. <coughs> That'll make thin pancakes. If it's thick, it'll make those thick, heavy pancakes that you get in restaurants. They're so no, boring. No, I want this thick. They're so boring. But the American people are boring, generally. 
right? You got that? You do. My dad becomes a ham when the camera's on. Thank you.